Hi all, let us finish our introduction to quantum computing. Last time we saw what quantum computing is and if you remember it was computing through the principles of quantum mechanics. In other words, we wanted to use the quantum mechanical properties to encode our computation. We saw that any computation is performed using some physical law. In particular, if we use the quantum mechanical properties to compute, that will be called a quantum computer. But it was also made clear that these properties, quantum mechanical properties we are talking about are the weird or the surprising properties of quantum, uh, quantum mechanics. They should not be the general classical property to compute. So whenever we use these weird surprising properties of quantum mechanics to do computation, that in our definition is quantum computing. A natural question is, what are these weird properties? So today, we take a look at one such property out of many. This is superposition. This is the reason why we can have constructive and destructive interference. I will just describe the physical effect and motivate you to read the details in a Wikipedia article. You can read about it more by searching for Mac Zender interferometer. This is the device, this is the name of the device which we will be using to explain the effect. But we, before we go to this interferometer, let's talk about a beam splitter which is a much simpler device and many of you might have seen it before. What is a beam splitter? You think of it as a half mirror. What do I mean by that? So this dash 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 shows the reflecting surface. If I have photons coming in this direction, let's say I have a photon gun here and photons coming here, sometimes it can reflect, sometimes it can refract. If I place two detectors, detector 2 and detector 1 here, then I will observe that both of them click 50% of the time. So sometimes the photon passes through, sometimes it gets reflected. This might not seem like a quantum effect. It is very easy to describe it classically. You can say before uh, the way I said it, 50% times the beam splitter reflects, 50% time it refracts. This is a classical probabilistic interpretation, nothing new and we have computers which use probabilistic interpretation. In other words, if we use this effect that could easily be simulated on a randomized machine. You might have seen randomized algorithms, you might have seen randomized computation. This cannot be the difference between a classical mechanics and quantum mechanics. But we are going to claim that there is something else going on here. The classical interpretation given here is not enough. To show that this classical definition is not enough, we have to make our experiment slightly more complicated. We will add some more beam splitters and mirrors. Let us let me make the diagram. This straight line is a mirror that means it always reflects. Remember, we had a beam splitter before. This is the one which sometimes reflects, sometimes reflects. I have another full mirror which always reflects and then another beam splitter. This time notice that the reflecting system is at the back. So the Reflect, reflection happens at the back edge. This is opposite of the other beam splitter. And then like before, I will place two detectors, detector 2 or let me just say detector 1 
and detector 2. I will start with a photon gun. There are two ways in which my photon can go to detector 1 and detector 2. One way is that it gets reflected here, reflected here and then goes to detector 2. This I will call, call the up route. Probably a bad nomen nomenclature but let's stick with it. The other is that it gets refracted, then reflected and then it can go to detector 1 or detector 2. This I will just call the down route. Given our probabilistic interpretation, it seems that again I will take the up route 50% of the time and I will take the down route 50% of the time. Since the same thing can happen at the other beam splatter, remember that mirrors, the two mirrors always reflect. So probability comes into the picture only at the beam splitters. In this case, in the first beam splitter, I have a 50% chance of going up, 50% chance of going down. Then the second one also, I have the same thing. And if you calculate the probability, it will turn out that detector 2 should click 50% of the time, detector 1 should click 50% of the time. That is because my photon can take the up route and then get reflected at the second beam splitter. That will contribute 25%. The other one is it takes the down route and then gets refracted at the second, second instance. Detector 2, there are two ways, up plus reflection at second beam splitter and the other direction is down plus refraction at second. So this will contribute 25%, 25% and hence detector 2 is 50%. Similarly, you can calculate the probability for detector 1. This means when I do this experiment and if my probabilistic interpretation was true, if the world behaved like classical mechanics, there is a big assumption, was true, then 1 and 2 should click half the time. This is what we anticipate from the probabilistic interpretation. It turns out that's not true. Detector 1 always clicks. That should come as a surprise to you. We never see detector 2. I want you to look at the picture again and convince yourself that by probability, if we say that beam splitter splits the beam 50% time, it reflects 15% time, it reflects, then this experiment should give me equal probability to go to detector 2 or detector 1. Though in nature, we don't see that. We see that detector 1, look at the top of the screen, the detector 1 always clicks. I will not go into the detail, uh, I, I will just uh, hope that you will go to the Wikipedia article and read about it. In a nutshell, the reason is that for detector 2, if you calculate the phase difference, uh, let me just say that the phase difference arises because of reflection from the front, reflection from the back edge, remember splitter has two edges, front and back and then transmission. All of them contribute differently in the phase difference and then if you calculate, it will turn out that at detector 2, you will have a destructive interference. At detector 1, you will have a constructive interference. 
I am using these words because I assume that you have heard of them in physics course and don't worry if you don't know the exact definitions of those uh, at this point you just need to intuitively understand and that's the reason why no photon had detected to. At this point intuitively understand what happens we will define the mathematics behind this and we will make sure that you understand why these things are happening. What is the quantum mechanical mathematics which explains this? And that actually will be our next step. The question we ask is, what do we need to understand these phenomena? And how can we encode computation using these phenomena? What do we need? It seems like we need to learn quantum mechanics. Good thing, the answer is no. What we need is just postulates of quantum mechanics. In some sense, when you learn classical computing, you don't have to really learn all the intricacies of Ohm's law, Kirchhoff's law, and everything. You realize that what are the subroutines, what are the gates which you can perform, what are the things which you can do, and then you build your theory on that. In the same way, we will understand what are the basic building blocks in quantum. Those are the postulates. And then we don't have to worry about quantum mechanics. Using these postulates will be good enough to learn quantum computing. Let me just tell you what are these postulates or not define them formally, but what are they going to talk about? There are going to be four postulates. One is going to be about how to store information. This definitely is needed for any computer. In the classical computer, you store them by bits, correct? You have either 0 or 1 and then every string, every picture, every video is basically a string of 0, 1. In a quantum computer, this will be done using qubits. What are qubits? What is the mathematical description of qubits? That will be a postulate of quantum mechanics. Second thing would be, what kind of operators can we apply on these qubits? You have information, but how can you manipulate your information? And we will see that the second postulate gives us the description of these operators. How can we manipulate information? That is what the second postulate describes. It's now in some sense intuitive to to say that the third thing is to get the output. That is the third postulate. The third postulate says how to find output. This might be very trivial in classical sense. In a classical computer, you just observe the bits and that's your answer. It turns out to be slightly tricky in the quantum case. We can only observe things by something called measurements and again this will be the content of the third postulate. The last thing, again very trivial in a classical case, how to represent multiple systems. In the classical case, it is easy, right? If you have to represent two systems, you just take two and put, put them together. You say, oh, this is the state of the first system, this is the state of the second system. It turns out to be complicated in the quantum case and simultaneously the reason behind the power of quantum mechanics. This will be here four postulates. Our target from next lecture is learn the required linear algebra behind these postulates and then get the mathematical definition. Once done with that, then we will move on to the quantum computer part where we will see a lot of applications, a lot of quantum elements. Thank you.